SpaceX's critical week begins. No other option left. Starship 37 is finally touched down at the launch site. After days of anticipation, it's now on the orbital launch mount, sitting on what they call the Star Stool, ready for its static fire campaign. This marks a crucial milestone in SpaceX's pre flight testing for Flight 10. Early morning, the 29th of July, saw the teams retract the SQD arm and begin final prep. By afternoon, Ship 37 had rolled through Gate D1, signaling that things are about to heat up. But instead of Massey's, SpaceX has decided to attempt a static fire at Launch Pad 1. Yesterday, on July 30th, SpaceX geared up for a static fire attempt. Everything seemed to be going according to plan. Propellant loading began. Reports confirmed that engine chill was underway. The countdown pointed to a test fire. But then, silence. The detanking process began. The test was scrubbed. No official reason was given, but observers noticed signs of a technical issue or a safety concern that forced SpaceX to hold back. For a program that thrives on rapid iteration, setbacks like this are part of the process. But this one hit a little differently. This isn't just a simple test anymore. It's an experiment within an experiment. The modified stand at Pad 1 isn't designed for this. Engineers had to create ad hoc plumbing setups with quick disconnect systems that are, quite frankly, being stress tested in real time. Any mistake here, any leak, any pressure issue could derail more than just this test. It could affect the entire timeline for Flight 10. Massey's was designed for this kind of testing. Pad 1 is for launches. But SpaceX is in a corner. Rebuilding Massey's will take time they don't have so the engineers had to improvise. Steel plates were welded to seal off any openings, protecting the delicate quick disconnect systems from exhaust blasts. Inside, reinforced posts were added to support the fragile Raptor vacuum engine nozzles, which are not designed to fire at sea level. But that's not even the tricky part. The stand needed to be attached to the launch mount, but the existing hold-down clamps were designed for boosters, not ships. So, SpaceX removed all 20 clamps and bolted on 20 custom standoff adapters. Then they welded the transport stand directly onto these adapters. Rough solution, but it worked. But SpaceX isn't one to back down. After yesterday's scrub, the team immediately reset for another attempt, probably today. Whatever happens, we'll give all the updates in our next video. The testing window is wide open from 7 in the morning to 7 in the evening central time. As of now, preparations are quietly building up behind the scenes. The exact timing of the test is a moving target, but expectations are high. Observers and enthusiasts have already seen signs of propellant loading equipment being prepped, while camera feeds show Ship 37 standing tall, waiting. If today's test proceeds, it will likely be a single-engine static fire. Earlier, there were whispers of a six-engine test, but those seem to have been shelved. The current focus is on precision, not power. After the damage with Ship 36, no one wants to risk another mishap on the OLM. But the risks haven't disappeared. The quick disconnect arm, which handles fuel and power connections, is under intense scrutiny. SpaceX engineers had to modify it on the fly after the Massey's accident. The makeshift adjustments are bold but boldness comes with consequences. They've seen this before. Fail, learn, fix, and try again. The Starship program's DNA is built on this philosophy. Today feels no different. Preparations are moving, slowly, methodically. Time is on SpaceX's side, but with each passing hour, the stakes quietly rise. SpaceX has not yet announced a T-Zero countdown, but chatter suggests that prop loading could commence in the next few hours. Will today be the day Ship 37 roars to life? Or will SpaceX face yet another silence? We'll know soon, but not yet. In the meantime, Ship 38 went cryoproof testing on July 30th evening, Central Daylight Time. No serious development there, 
probably everything went well. But the thermal protection system is far from finished. Large portions of Ship 38 are still missing tiles, especially around the lower and middle rings. That's weeks of work ahead. So expect Ship 38 to take a detour back to Mega Bay 2 for a long stay. Flight 10 is expected in mid-August, but there's a catch. SpaceX doesn't have time to prepare Ship 38 for a static fire before then. So if Flight 10 is a success, Ship 38 might never fly. On the other hand, if Flight 10 fails, Ship 38 becomes SpaceX's last chance to salvage data from Block 2. But there's a third, more calculated option. Fly Ship 38 anyway, regardless of Flight 10's result, to squeeze out every bit of data for Block 3. Meanwhile, at McGregor, SpaceX has been putting Raptor engines through their paces. 11 tests this week alone, totaling around 400 seconds of firing time. SpaceX isn't slowing down. Work on Pad 2 is in full swing. The new Quick Disconnect system, essential for Block 3 Starship upgrades, is taking shape. Unlike Pad 1, Pad 2 will feature twin QDs, speeding up refueling times. Back at Pad 1, SpaceX lifted a clamp-like piece onto the ship adapter, likely a final component for the static fire adapter setup. Shortly after, they purged the propellant lines, clearing out debris before the quick disconnect plate installation. As of now, the decision isn't clear, but as the sun sets over Starbase, one thing is certain, this week is pivotal. And there's a wild card. Elon Musk just hinted at a live technical Starship update before Flight 10. Could that announcement change everything? We'll find out soon. For now, Starship could launch again next month. Musk's post hinted at an early August timeline for the 10th flight. But with three setbacks, can SpaceX overcome these challenges in time to meet Musk's Mars timeline? The rocket is poised and ready. But will the launch next month bring success, or will it add to the string of explosive failures? The countdown's begun, and the world watches in suspense. In other news, on Wednesday morning, in the small town of Bowen, Queensland, Australia, was about to make history. A 23-meter-tall rocket named Eris stood on the launch pad, designed, built, and ready to be the first Australian-made rocket to reach orbit from home soil. For Gilmore Space Technologies, this wasn't just another launch, this was their moonshot. After months of delays, first in May, then earlier this month, because of stubborn technical glitches and unpredictable weather, the countdown was finally ticking. The engines ignited. All four hybrid-propelled engines roared to life, lifting Eris off the pad. For a few seconds, it seemed like a dream was becoming real. The rocket cleared the tower, hovered in the air, and then something went wrong. In a flash, the rocket veered off its path and vanished from sight. The entire flight lasted just 14 seconds. No injuries were reported. To outsiders, it looked like a crash, but inside Gilmore Space Technologies, the mood wasn't defeat. They were calling it a success. CEO Adam Gilmore echoed that sentiment. He admitted he wished for more flight time but was satisfied. Months earlier, he had already set the bar. If the rocket leaves the ground, it's a win. In the private space game, almost no one gets it right on the first shot. The infrastructure of the launch site was untouched. That in itself was a relief. But the clock is still ticking. Because while Eris rose only for 14 seconds, the next attempt could be just around the corner. And this time, the sky won't be enough. That's all for now. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe for more videos like this. Hit the like button if you find the video interesting. And kindly provide your valuable feedback in the comment section. This will help us to improve.